my name is Simi J. Potoka, and my pronouns are they, them. And my name is Hannah Crawford, and my pronouns are she, her. And we are... The Dreaming Divas. We are a podcast inspired by the Screaming Divas. And it is our goal to create a similar platform, but from the perspective of a young singer. And today we had on EM2 Connect, which is a partnership between Emily Martin and Elizabeth McDonald. Together, the pair uh, career coach, teach privately, and maintain active performing careers. We are so grateful to have had them on today. We had some really, really amazing conversations, so feel free to check it out. But before that, we are, would like to graciously acknowledge that together we reside, learn, and create on the land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabewaki, Mississauga, Wendaki, Neon, Winsio, and Neutral People. We seek re-Indigenization. We stand with the Indigenous community and welcome Indigenous voices on this platform. We are grateful to be working and learning on and about this land. We honor these communities as the traditional stewards of these lands. We hope you enjoy. Enjoy. Ding. 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 I never know. <laughs> uh, well, Emily and Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so, so excited to have you on. Oh, thank you. Hi. Oh, I'm so, so happy to be here. <laughs> like, hello. Hello. Hi. Are we doing introductions? Hi. Uh, we would love if you guys wanted to start off with your land acknowledgements. Um, right. Elizabeth, would you like to go? Yes. Or would you like me to go? No, I'm I'm happy to go. I um, I'm uh, calling in from uh, Prince Edward County, my home where I live, and um, it's the home of the Haudenosaunee, the Huron Wendat, and the Iroquois people, and it is covered by uh, Land Treaty Number Five. And I'm grateful to be able to live and work and make art on this land. Thank you. I am calling in from the lands of the Susquehannock peoples, and I am privileged to be able to make art and live on the land um, that they, that were the original caretakers. So, and my pronouns are she, her. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank you guys so much. Um, we like to start off with a fun little 60 second life story. I know there's a lot to fit in 60 seconds because you are both very accomplished, uh, but feel free to do your best. I will keep the timer up on the screen here and uh, who would like to begin? <laughs> well, are you, you so there's a, yeah, really? So there is a timer because I don't see it. Where's the timer? Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Do you want me to go, Elizabeth? You better go. You started talking first. <laughs> okay, sorry. Let's go. Okay, so I was born in Connecticut. I went to high school in Connecticut. Then when I was 16, I graduated and I went to Boston University for um, my bachelor's in voice. I had gone to the Tanglewood program before that. So that's why I went to Boston University. Then I went to the Academy of Vocal Arts for my master's slash artist diploma, not really a master's, but whatever. And then I moved to New York City and um, I had a career as a singer and I sang all over and I had management and I really hated it because all I had was a dog and a 200 square foot apartment and I was traveling all the time and I'd been through a couple failed relationships. So I was going to quit and then I was recruited by a teacher at the University of Colorado Boulder to come there do my DMA. I laughed because I hadn't taken a theory class since I was 18 years old. She said, ha ha, I auditioned. I did it. It was wonderful. I graduated in 2012. I had a child and got married. I had another child. Now I'm a tenured professor at Bucknell University in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Boom. Wow. <laughs> wow. You were still talking about school. I was getting a little worried there. I did it. I was, I was like, if you have any more degrees, you're about to run out of time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, well. <laughs> All right, you have oh a tough gosh. competition there, Elizabeth, whenever I you're know. ready. I know, I know. Okay, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, so I was born and raised in Prince Edward County, which is where I still live, which I did leave. When I left, I went to the University of Toronto. I did a performance degree, and then I spent two years uh, working in a restaurant, wondering what I was going to do with my life, and I went to the Banff Center, and it changed my life. I got into the Eastman School of Music, and I did a Master of Music there, and met some incredible people, and did so many auditions in New York where they said no, and I learned how to take rejection really well. But I only needed one audition to go well, and that did, and that was the Santa Fe Opera, and so I spent the summer 
that I got married at the Santa Fe Opera as an apprentice artist and then I came home and got pregnant and when I came home I also got hired by the Canadian Opera Company um, as an ensemble artist and I made my debut there when I was seven months pregnant for my daughter Victoria who is 20 right now and um, after that I sort of crashed and burned because I didn't know what to do so I had a son and uh, lived at home here for a while with my husband and then I started teaching at Queen's University and then in 2010 I went to the University of Toronto where I'm a sessional instructor and I teach uh, a whole bunch of students applied students and a course and I I started EM2 in uh, 2020 with Emily because of the pandemic at the end. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not bad, not bad. Yeah, no, gotta say, bad. you guys are a lot closer than uh, me and Cass ever were, so that's good. I think yeah. I still hold the world record, so. I think you do, but you left but out a lot of good parts. But so. you're also 25 years younger than us. That's a good point. <laughs> and right? what is the world record? Like, I don't, yeah. we weren't even told the world record before we did it. <laughs> No, it That's didn't. I want to stress you out. Oh, <laughs> oh but that didn't give us any ability to break the world record. You see, yeah, no, so... we couldn't have. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it's a competition. I think no, no. the goal is to get as much information as possible, and I think you guys did great. You did great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Phew. Um, I'm so glad, uh, Elizabeth, you brought up EM2 because I feel like that is the main topic of why we are here. So I was wondering if you guys could talk about how it got started and why. I know you said it started uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and what led to that? Well, I'll start with that and then Em can um, pick up where I leave, which is um, when the pandemic hit, uh, we are two of three uh, members of Women on the Verge, a trio that uh, is about Canadian female composers and um, and advancing the stories of women on stage and so we were we produced a, a series of talks online talks at the beginning of the pandemic called um uh, now i've forgotten what they were called training the singer educating the future singer, singer post covid 19. thank you thank you they're up on youtube and doing that as women on the verge emily and i just we really had already been talking about wanting to do more producing of of things like that um, so there was that that happened. And then at the same time, or sort of simultaneously, um, I had a number of singers that had graduated from school that were being in touch. And they wanted lessons, but they didn't know what they wanted to do. And they didn't know where they wanted to go. And, and the pandemic, of course, was making it even more challenging. And Emily and I had, had a million conversations about what does a career look like now anyway? And then the pandemic completely exasperated it in so many ways and sped up sort of the, the crash and burn of, of um, what an artist can do with uh, their skill set or their lack thereof. Um, so we decided to start um, EM to Connect. And um, it's the idea that there are two of us, the power of two for ideation. And we um, really have dug into this idea of mentorship and helping artists create uh, a multifaceted career that isn't just a one track career. Um, we know that uh, maybe 1% of artists are going to have that elite career, um, the one track career. And what happens to the rest of us? Uh, and I think Emily and I are good examples that uh, 30 or 60 second outline kind of says a little bit of the journey, but it, it doesn't talk about the entrepreneurship and the beginnings of the projects we've all done and all that kind of stuff. And so we really thought that we've had a lot of experience outside of just singing and just academia that uh, we wanted to bring to other singers and other artists and have those conversations and really guide them through asking hard questions and figuring out what they were missing and what they were interested in. So that was EM2. And then and then in that, Emily was like, I really want to start a community. So I'm actually going to lob this one to Em because the community is really the thing she's, we're both passionate about it, but she was the ideator on that one. So well, yeah. I'll just say that lobbing, it's like ugh, right in the head there. Thank you very much. I didn't so. smash it. I didn't smash <laughs> no, it at you. True. I loved just, it. I loved just it gently. Loved it. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it was very good. I think I just want to sort of um, point out what Elizabeth was saying about what does success mean? I mean, that was really what it came down to is that Elizabeth and I have had success in many areas of our life. We have both had success the way it was actually defined at one point, which what is that even, you know, in the singer's life. So that was really where EM2 came out of too, was just helping singers define what actually success meant for them. So I, um, I also was really uh, interested in creating community that wasn't Facebook, 
Um, I know most of us have had some sort of um, trauma in our life from social media at some point. Um, and I actually had never had a huge amount of trauma. I just was part of that generation that didn't rely on Facebook. Um, and so I knew that there was more out there to actually getting to know people. And I am very appreciative of the communities on Facebook that are there for singers. I learned a lot during the pandemic and how I was going to keep teaching through all of that. But I really wanted a place where we could help each other be successful and not just in singing. So if you got that audition, great. But if you, you know, memorize that role, that's really great as well. Or if you got a job to support your singing habit, that's really great as well. Like all of it is a success. And so I think it's really important that we found a place. So we started from the voice of, um, so you can go to from the voice of.com and join for free. It's a free community. We have over 200 members and I will say that we have a sometimes we're having sort of a hard we want people to sort of engage a little bit more than they're doing right now. Um, so we're, we're working on it, right? Community is hard to build online. And um, but we're really proud of what we've done so far. And um, we're really excited to what it could become. So yeah. yeah, I think it's it's important too. it's been very inspiring for our process too. It like starting out, like Simi, Cassandra and I all starting this crazy kind of online platform it's it's really inspiring to see people who you sort of know like i we all we all kind of know each other in, in a sense um but i think it's really inspiring to see the the success of you makes us inspired to try to also be successful you know what i mean cool totally. that's, that's great well, that's it's wonderful. that idea of sharing what our success is and being able to talk about them mm -hmm. so yeah Thank you for that. That's lovely that you said that. <laughs> it's very true. Um, like I, yeah. I, I like to join your your um, Zoom. You usually have guests on Fridays, um, and it's a Zoom call, so people can just join. And I take a lot of how you run those into this podcast. And I also listen to your Women on the Verge podcast, getting this, getting the song out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And I, I take inspiration from that and how you carried the conversation because you carried it so well and what the topics were and how you asked the questions. That's small, but it's a big part of how I run this. So it's, it is very cool to have people to look up to in that sense. And this isn't even singing. We're just talking about singing. So mm -hmm. that's no, it's, it's so lovely to hear that because I will say that Elizabeth and I, it's actually one of the things we like most of everything we do is the community and conversations. We call them community and conversation where we talk to people and artists and about their stories, not just what they're successful at, but their stories of how they got there. And, you know, we did it, we started that because we had a lot of really cool friends that had really cool stories. I mean, and, and we think we're pretty good at it, but honestly, you know, Simi, it's great to hear that because we just do it. And then the fact that like, you're like, oh, it's really good. I'm like, okay, right? So it's wonderful to hear that you're, you've gotten that. Like anything that anybody can get out of anything that we do, that's, that's where our success is, right? If we can um, and give people those tools. Yeah, it's great. Thank you, Simi. Of course. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could get into, um, you talked about your community, but what EM2 Connect, what, what is that? I know you offer a lot of different types of things. Could you get into the different things that you offer as a duo? Sure. So EM2 Connect is really, a, a, we're a coaching team. And um, we take on clients that um, are artists that are looking to dig into a process of discovery. And um, our program is called The Process. Uh, so we have a variety of different options for artists. They can do um, a one-off conversation with us where they can come and say, I'm thinking about this project. Can you give me some ideas? And we'll spend an hour and we'll just throw stuff at a wall. Um, one of the things that Emily and I are really, really good at is thinking big picture and coming up with every crazy idea you never imagined yourself. And usually when people come into this space and they say a couple of things about what they're thinking about, between the two of us, somebody will go away with 50 new ideas and it's over. It could be overwhelming. So we're working on trying not to overwhelm people in that, <laughs> in that piece, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and so that's a one-off. We have, we have a, another one where you can come in and you want some follow-up. You want uh, feedback, but you want follow-up. And so we'll follow up with you through email and texting and things like that for a few weeks afterwards. Um, and, uh, and then we have the longer term programs. If you want to work with us for a little bit longer, um, we have a four, 
we're, we're, we're in the process of like shifting and changing, but, but, but generally we have anywhere between four and six meetings over um, three and four months is about what, what we do. And so we work in a process where we discover um, your artistic philosophy and then we ideate from there with all of the different projects you're working on. We try to help you focus on what, what's the most important thing right now that you want to look at. And then how do we brainstorm, um, how do we brainstorm ideas and then how do we take those ideas into action? And so we really try to work through that process to get people at, by the end of their meeting with us to have something that they, they know what the next step is. Um, and we know that as artists, there's always a next step, but there's also like a hundred more steps. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, <laughs> there's always a hundred more steps. So we're not, we're not, we can't say in six sessions we can get you the 100 steps but we can help you start to walk a little bit towards something specific and as you're doing that you might discover a few other things along the way so um so that's that's the 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 coaching part of em2 and we do all of that together so every meeting you have is with both of us um which again, we're pretty high energy, except at the beginning of this call, we are both kind of dub, but it's also just FYI, we're older now and it's after 7.30. So it's, a, it's like- I don't apologize know, that I go to bed at like eight. So it's just- no, We're both up at like 5.30. So, you know, whatever. So usually we do those during the day when we have lots of energy, just FYI. <laughs> Um, and then the other part of EM Square is this, that is the, that's the platform where we do all of our private uh, voice lesson teaching, basically. So anybody who wants to take a voice lesson, whether, and, and we do it, all, we do all the voice lesson a la carte, because sometimes people want to come and see you every week. Sometimes they want to see you twice a week, month. Sometimes they want to just check in every once in a while. Um, and we're in trans, we're all in transition now with the pandemic. Like we've been online now for a year and a half. And now I'm like, you know, I see some of my students in Toronto, like my university students in person. So now it's like, ooh, at what point do we see our private clients? Cause I live in the boonies. Like, do people come here? So we'll see, we'll see how that happens. But that is what EM2 Connect is. And it's just em2connect.com if anybody's, as they're listening, want to sort of creep us and, and check things out and get the details. Well, so. we'll definitely put it in the description box, sure. of, box of course. But yeah, I was just thinking I, the coaching side of what you guys do is actually, I didn't quite realize it was that in depth. And I think I can probably speak for Simi on this, that go, being out of university and kind of like thrown into the world of singing without all the advice from your teachers, from your professors, from your voice teachers, from your coaches, it can feel very, very scary. So it's kind of, and I've never heard Personally, I've never heard of career coaching in that in that depth before, especially very accessible for young singers. So I think that's very well, important think, to have. Thank you, Hannah. I think I think what it came out of is that we realized both the, because both of us are academic teachers as well, you know, in academic mm -hmm. institutions, we realized and we had the same issue is that you have this whole team, right? So you're essentially and during your degree, you're paying for a team. Right. So when you have, you know, diction that you need or you have questions about grad school or whatever, you know who you can go to and you're not paying extra for them. You just rely on them. They're your team. And then you all of a sudden graduate. You're like, hmm? you're done. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can pay the same amount to all of them that you paid for your degree <laughs> after your degree yeah, to exactly. keep getting that work. Yeah. Right. And so I think, you know, that was sort of where a lot of this came out is that we had that problem and all of our students were having that problem. But also we realized um, that degrees nowadays, especially nowadays, they also during our time, but nowadays do not give most of the tools that artists, young artists need to be to be successful. Yeah. You probably can sing the best high C or you can sing a great run or you can, I don't know your voice at all, Hannah, but, but like, you know, maybe you're a contralto. I have no idea, but like, you know, if, if, uh, you know, you can, maybe you can sing the best note that you've ever sung, but you have no idea, like how you're going to find an audience for that note. You have no idea how you're going to find the way to support yourself and also do, you know, the, the, 
the passion that you have in writing with your singing or whatever yeah, yeah. it is there's and we call it being an artistic citizen you know the artistic citizenship which is if you're really pro social justice like if that's something super important to you which everybody should be nowadays but if that is something super important to you how do you bring that into your singing or do you just have it on the side like how is it all connected and so i think those were all questions that we had and we hope we can at least you know the tip of the iceberg for some of our the students and some of the people we work with to help them with that. Mm -hmm. Well, and if I can just jump on what Emily said with respect to the idea of team, you know, when you're in a, in undergrad or grad school, that teacher and those coaches, they're all available to you all the time. Of course, yep. Right? You're that full-time client. And then when you leave school, they are not available to you all the time because they have their next round of clients. And with that then comes things like, how do I know what repertoire to sing or to bounce ideas off of? Who's gonna write me a letter of recommendation? Um, who's gonna offer me connections? Who's gonna, who's gonna talk to me when, just before I go to an audition, I'm freaking out about something. So there's all those things that sort of came in that package that now are no longer available to you. And I think that there's also a conversation about you know, there's a lot of extra work that that university academic teachers do that young artists don't realize are extra until they go out in the world and someone says, sure, I'll write you that letter, but it's going to cost you 50 bucks or or it's going to cost you my time to have a conversation. Whereas before, you know, your teacher was getting a full time salary to be there to answer all those questions because they were related to your degree. And so I think that's the other thing we have to, that we're trying to have a conversation about. Um, it's that free labor, especially as women, especially as women, we give so much free labor. And, and, and I wanna be clear that of course, I wanna serve my students, um, but we all know that if we don't serve ourselves first, there's nothing for our clients or our students. And so continuing to have that conversation so that if we can model that for the young artist, then the young artist isn't going to do stuff for free either. And that is the big, that's a big topic of conversation, of course, as well. So, so hopefully that all sort of, I mean, there's just so much in there to unpack always, eh? So, <laughs> so glad you brought that up because that is a big part of you know, mental health right now as well is just making sure that you have everything you need to be able to do your job or, you know, be available to the clients, that kind of stuff. Um, I was wondering if we could um, kind of back up a little bit. Um, you mentioned uh, the idea of success, because that is obviously what we all strive to. And I was wondering what you would tell somebody who is trying to figure out what their idea of success is in relation to the arts, outside of the arts, however you would like to word it? Well, the first thing is I wouldn't tell them what success is. I'd, I'd help them discover what it is for them. Individual. Yes. Really yeah. Individual. <laughs> and yeah. that's not the answer. She wants us to do more though, Elizabeth. She wants us to say more. I know, I know. <laughs> and, and you know what, you and I sort of riffed on that because there was a, yeah, oh, it was, it was another question, but anyway, it doesn't matter. We, we did, we actually prepared for you all today. We wrote yeah. notes and stuff like they're up sure. on the screen. Surprised, Be yeah. Mostly because it was after 7.30 PM and we knew our brains would shut <laughs> off if we didn't have like little cue cards. Yeah. That sounds right. Well, no, what, we riffed, what we riffed about was that, you know, when we were students, success was one thing. Yes. And that was the professional yeah. opera career, period. And right? if you there didn't do that, you were a failure. You were a failure, period. Like there like, was no if and or and buts. Was, you could not have another job. You could not have no. anything. You were going to be a professional singer. And that was the only success. And you didn't sing in the chorus. Right. You didn't do yeah. Compromario roles. You were gunning for, you know, Countess yeah. Tosca, Fiorligi, whatever. Your, part, your yeah. voice type, right? It still and feels like that. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Because, because we haven't changed academia. We yeah. haven't changed academia and we have not, we have not questioned the narrative, Until right? The, the narrative was years. set in hundred years ago or 200 years ago. And we are one of the last, I think, careers that is not questioning the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the opera companies, let's just turn this on its head for a minute. The opera companies are our customer. The ones who are hot, we are the, the people who are providing the product, right? But for some reason, we have now decided that our customer can tell us 
you know, what kind of product instead of us demanding the customer to buy our product. It's a very, the whole thing is just, the narrative is so messed up in so many ways, right? And so it's not realistic now for a professional opera career. Even if you are Joyce D. Donato, it's not, it is not realistic, right? Because she's doing a million things as well. She's not just yeah. singing in opera houses. So I think it's, um I think it's important. So I don't, I went off on a tangent there. I'm sorry, I was having a moment. <laughs> But, so good. So, I love but, it. I love it. <laughs> but I think, you know, until we start to really think about what the narrative is and how we want to change it, there's we can't define success because nobody will be happy. So I mean this comes back to the statistic citizenship thing that I was talking to talking about before and Elizabeth and I believe really strongly in is that we need holistic singers. And so success is when you have found what your values are and you feel like you are communicating your values in your art period and that could be in a community chorus that could be on the metropolitan opera stage that can be in a musical theater show in you know wherever that can be whatever it is as long as they're your values and you feel like you are communicating them through your art sorry i got really no that's <laughs> okay there are some people i hope at this hear time that. of night <laughs> what sorry I, there are some people that I hope really hear that, you know? Oh, really? I, okay, agree. Oh, yeah. I hope so, too. <laughs> well, look, yeah. folks, like, people are still going to be, we're, we're always going to have the, the, holdout, the holdouts, right? People are still going to have their elitist ideas, and it is very hard to break that. I am, I will be the first to admit that they're... You know, I am really picky about who I want to teach and and how I want to teach and all of that kind of stuff. And I have a very specific idea about how th I think things should be. <laughs> and and it's it can it can be really challenging sometimes when you have a, a unique individual in front of you, which is every new person, just so you're clear, I'm not a complete idiot, but it can be really challenging when someone is in front of you and you know that if they do these three things, they'll be able to do the next step. But they're kind of wandering around and and whether that's because they're dis distracted by some course they're taking that's taking all their time and whatever. And I have to constantly remind myself that in this situation, for instance, in university, this this student right now is super interested and super engaged in this course that is not what I'm talking about they need to go through the process of discovery to figure out do they want to make the singing piece the thing that's right there or is the singing piece going to be part of a bigger picture and how do we talk about that right because i i, I believe at a certain point the chips fall and you just figure it out it's messy it's gross it's ugly a solo like a single track to one destination is not messy. You know, I've had one student do that. That's it. And I've taught a lot of singers. <laughs> and so I think that it's just, we, we, we all have to be flexible and open. And I wasn't before. I was whoever it is that you're thinking of that needed to hear that, right? So everybody comes to it eventually because they, they, they have to. Anyway, that was my tangent. There you go. Done. The end. Here for the tangents. And I'm with you. I also was that person. I thought, okay, this is what success is. If you make it to the Met, if you make it to La Scala, then you've become successful. And clearly that's changed, but. Hmm. I was just thinking. Well, you, never know. you still might be. You still might be La Scala, but you, but you might not consider it successful if you make it there. That's the other thing, right? Yeah. Is that you might make it to the Metropolitan Opera and you might not feel that that's success at that point, right? So that's why success has to come in here rather than out there. So sorry, I'm Hannah. I jumped on. No, it's all good. I was just going to interject that the what we're talking about with success sounds a lot like perfection and the two ideas kind of coincide with each other. And mm -hmm. so once you kind of realize that you're not a perfect person, your success might fall in line a little easier. Well, I also think that we have ideas like Simi was saying, you know, when we're 23, I don't know how old you are, Simi. I'm, I'm really young. 22. Oh, 22. 20, oh, okay. um, so I won't even tell you how old I am, but I'll just say that like, you know, at 22, I thought that success was this. And I think a lot of times in this field, at least this is all I think of our experience, but we have idea what success is and then we don't change. 
and life happens and we keep thinking that's success, right? And life happens and we keep we keep coming back to that rather than understanding that my success now, it, what I consider successful is very, very different than what I considered successful at 22, right? And it's not bad or good, it just is what it is. And the more we can also, is this idea of malleable that Elizabeth was talking about being reactionary and being proactive rather than reactionary, excuse me, I think is really important to understand that you got to go with the flow, right? And understand that things are going to change and that success, the idea of success is going to change. Yeah. And it changes if you have kids. It changes if you have a big life event. And for me, it was getting married and have children. That totally changes how you're going to function. It doesn't have to, but it did for me, right? So as an example. So we chatted a little bit earlier about um the kind of the our community and the kind of the the negative things associated with it so have you guys ever had any idea about what you feel specifically needs to be changed in our community and as young singers what can you recommend to help us do it <laughs> Ooh, that oh, was not question. on the list of questions you said yeah. that is a big good question <laughs> <laughs> we might have added some late additions i apologize no no don't no, apologize it's just such a great question to dig into do you want to start em because you should sure, i mean yeah i i mean i'm i'm a really i'm a i'm really interested in one path sort of right now for where i think we need to go which is i think that the more we teach our singers our musicians our artists who they are as people then they will find the path of success and they will change the musical world period, right? So I think that the more that you can as a young singer really either find a book or a person or anybody that can help you really delve into, sit down and figure out your artistic value set, what your values are, and then really say, how am I going to integrate this into what I do? It then becomes easier to, to understand if you don't get an audition or you don't, um, or if you need to say no to a job, right? Because then you realize that, you know, doing that gig um, that is just not what was part of your value set. And then you start thinking about, well, what can I do that's part of my value set? And you start curating recitals and you start finding other singers and other directors and other people that you can collaborate with to do that production about this story that you're passionate about or this you know, or these people that you're passionate about. That's, this is how we change the world. It's not big steps, it's small, small steps. So you're not gonna change it going right to the Met. That's just not how it works. But you're gonna change it if you're true to your values and you find those other people who want to collaborate in those values. And then that's when the audience listens, right? That is really why an audience is there, is to see who you are and to feel the feelings that they're feeling at the same time and can't express. So, I mean, I would just say that, yes, there are lots of little things I could say, like I think we need to teach, like Elizabeth and I talk about this financial literacy to our you know, singers. I think we need to teach more than just entrepreneurship. We actually need to teach how to you know, be a manager of a company, how to produce, how to direct, how to do all of those things. But ultimately, they go down deep. It's you finding your values and being true to those values in the jobs, in the work, and everything that you you go towards I just lost words all of a sudden it's really late okay <laughs> well and if I can piggyback on that with this idea that finding your values and doing all of that is 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 the great big idea but how do we do that how do we do that in in an in an undergrad degree or a conservatory or 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 a master's program or what have you and and I think what what we have to do is we have to shift the thinking from I am the expert and my information is what I'm going to slap on top of you and apply like foundation that doesn't match your skin tone. Mm -hmm. What I what I think has to happen is basically student led learning, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's how do I create a, a broad structure with information that then guides you to your own result mm -hmm. as opposed to me saying you have to sing 12 songs and they have to be in three languages and it has to be four four genres 
and done the end mm -hmm. there's value there's certainly value in that if that is what we value but if that is not what a student values how then do we encourage their artistic growth and it's i think what's what's really challenging is that first of all we're working in a in a system that is first of all not flexible it's also not flexible for women so that's a whole other thing um uh and and not flexible for women or non-binary or people of color or 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 let's just we'll put everybody except the white man in that bucket <laughs> um and so we we have a system that's not flexible and then we have all of us that have been brought up in that and and trying to figure out how to how to um challenge that and change that but still, I still need to take home a paycheck. And so there's that. And then the, then the last piece is, and this is, I say this to my singers a lot often, is right now we're in a time where we are teaching and creating programs for a product that we can't imagine. Interesting. How, how the hell do I do that? I mean, and even if you want to drill that down to singing, you know, Simi, think about some of the lessons where when I say to you, how does that feel different? And you're like, well, I don't feel anything. How do we chase that non sensation? Right. And so we're doing the same thing in academia. How do we how do we qualify quantify that? How do I give you a grade on that? <laughs> I mean, it's hard enough to give you a grade on singing, but how do I do you know what I mean? And so I think that in academia, I think it's going to be a really big challenge, which is why I think singers have to look beyond their degree and just know that there are, there's many more steps in the journey. The degree is the, the starting point. It is not the end point. Wow. That is not how I saw it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 We exactly. I mean, you think you're going to roll out of your degree and you're going to have a job and you're going to be singing at the Met in two years. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice, right? That'd be yeah. ideal. <laughs> but you wouldn't actually, be ready. Actually, I mean, it wouldn't be ideal, thing, right? It no. would not be ideal. It'd yeah. actually be incredibly, if you, do you know what I mean? Like university does not prepare you to stand on the stage of the Met. No, and Trust really me doesn't. on that. It does not do that. Right. It does not prepare you to stand on the stage of any professional opera company. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could go for days. We could go for days. Oh really. God. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe it gives week. you some of the tools, but it doesn't really bring it all together. It takes time to bring it all together. So I'm just going to leave it at that before I get <laughs> angry emails from my friends that work in opera companies. <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> This is yet another topic that was not on the list, so we, we can brush <laughs> over it if you don't want to talk about it. Um, but specifically for um, Elizabeth, um, you have a student who quote unquote made it. And I was wondering if you could talk about how that idea of success and that went down, but do you feel that a lot of students come to you because they want that? And how oh, do you yeah. direct them in a way that is more true to what they are, their idea of success is for themselves? So what I will say is that I think that the market, the market uh, solves, <laughs> solves for X, right? And I am one piece of the singing market. So I can give you one piece of information. I can't give you all the pieces of information and I can't change who you are. So I can give you the information that I have, but your job is to be able to put my information and the coach and the conductor and the stage director and all that to be able to put that together. And the mental health aspect, the do I practice aspect, there are so do many Do I know things. how to practice? Do I know what right. questions to ask? Do I know right. how to prepare my music? Can I learn music? Um, Can I not drink the night before I have to sing? Oh, question. I mean, it's just, sorry, did, Elizabeth, did you just go somewhere? Did I okay, freeze? Sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. I just thought I lost you. Oh, but I think that, um, so sad. 
But sorry, I don't mean to jump in, but yeah, but you're right. There's so much more to making it than I think most people say. But sorry, Elizabeth, I'm not going to jump in here anymore. Go. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. No, it's funny because I've taught a lot of mezzos in the last few years as a result of my student success. Um, and I mean, at the end, of, and, and so I know a lot of mezzo rep now and I, you know, or more than I did before, which is great for me. It's awesome, right? Um, but I think, you know, I think, how how do I deal with them? It's like, well, you either take the information I offer you and do something with it or you don't. But as a voice teacher, and this is in the role of the voice teacher, not as the coach mentor. So in the role of the voice teacher, my job is very specific, right? And so I'm really clear. This is what my job is. Like, I don't do all that other stuff. That's not the scope, the scope of my practice. My job is to make you an efficient singer, period. What you do with that has a lot to do with other things that's beyond what my work is. So you want to have a conversation about career and all that, then that's a different, that's in a different way. So that's mostly how I deal with it. And like I said at the beginning, the market, the market determines things and it's not always fair. It's not always the best singer. It's not always all those things, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So much of it's luck and I don't think a lot of people understand I think oh, that a lot of it is luck goodness you know and to, until you really understand that if you are if you walk out of the elevator before the person who's going to hire you walks in then you've missed that right it's 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 just luck and it doesn't you can do all the work I mean there's a lot of factors to it I'm not going to say it's the only factor but there are a lot of factors well I remember in my last year of grad school I sang for the Canadian Opera Company for the ensemble program and that was in the fall and I got rich I didn't even get a call back and then four months later I sang for Santa Fe and I got a contract and I'm in Santa Fe and I'm understudying on the show that Richard Bradshaw is conducting and he was the general director of the Canadian Opera Company and he said to me how come I don't know who you are you're Canadian. How come I don't know who you are? And he picked up the phone and the next day I had a contract for the Young Artist Program. Literally, wow. I am not exaggerating. I sang for him and he went, okay, you're moving back to Toronto. Great. I mean, <coughs> wild. Whoa. That's wild. talk about lucky. I mean, I had done the work, but it doesn't, I mean, I'd sung a million auditions, right? You only need one person to say yes. And sometimes that's a sometimes it's lucky. And also, was, sometimes it's not the person you think is going to say yes. That's the other thing. Yeah, right? yeah. Comes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was well. Anyway, I have fun questions. Something that's really exciting for me, um, Emily. I know that you are a certified yoga instructor, <laughs> um, and I know personally, like that, the whole yoga journey and yoga. Um, in a singer's body has been super enriching and enlightening in my life just in the last I would say maybe two three years like discovering mm -hmm. it and um, it's something that I feel very passionate about and something I want to keep learning so I would love for you to kind of tell us your story of how you found that was that bef before singing did it happen after your career before your career like where did it fall in line for you? Wow. Um, it's funny. Nobody's ever asked me to tell this story before. So now I don't have like a canned answer like I usually do for other stuff. Um, <laughs> Surprise. Uh, that's, so what kind of yoga can do you practice in that? Can I ask? Uh, YouTube. <laughs> That's good. Yoga. YouTube yes. yoga. I love that's it. That's the Adrian? best kind. Adrian? Yeah, Adrian, Adrian with yoga. Adrian? Yoga flow is my favorite usually. So nice. cool. Oh Ho Beautiful is also a good one, but it's a lot more advanced stuff. So stick to the beginner videos. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. I don't know any YouTube video uh, YouTube yoga. So um so that's good to know. I mean I know who Adrian is, but I yeah. don't for, for a variety of reasons. There's a there's a story there too. But um so I came to yoga. I actually came to yoga. Let me think about this. I was in, it wasn't in Santa Fe because that's where I got my second certification. My first certification was in New York City. And I think I was just going to a studio. I, had, I When I moved to New York City, I, I was going through a divorce. Oh, and actually, yeah, I was going through a divorce. That was my first marriage. I going through a divorce, and that's a long story. And um, I had really tried to figure out, like, what to do. Like, I just, I had, I had gone to Milwaukee. <laughs> There's so many things. This is the very first job I ever got as a singer. Once I graduated from school, I had crashed an audition in New York that my pianist knew about. And I got that job. 
see that's what I mean like you just don't know right I didn't get the job I was at after audition for I got the job I crashed the audition and it was in Milwaukee and I met a woman there who's now the head of production at the Metropolitan Opera Paula Swazi who is a good friend of mine and I was going through a divorce and she was like you need to do triathlons she's like that's what I did when I went through my divorce so that's what you need to do and uh, she invited me to do a triathlon. I thought she was crazy, but I ended up, long story short, doing um, some triathlons and realizing that the only way I was going to keep my head on straight when I was going through divorce, moving to New York City, doing all the things was to just work out. Right. So I was biking. I was I mean, I had the time in New York because I had temp jobs and stuff like that. I was working out like three hours a day. Like I was just at it. I was going for it. And I was doing triathlons and I was, a, I got my spinning certification and everything. And I didn't teach spinning for like two years, but in the meantime, I was also going to yoga and I was going to this vinyasa studio in Midtown West, Hell's Kitchen, around Hell's Kitchen. And it was really intense. It was really, really, really intense. So I got Which is why you loved it. <laughs> yeah, it was super intense, right? It was like hard rock music while you were doing vinyasa for like an hour and a half, oh, wow. right? Yeah, it was like super, super intense. And so I got a certification there and it was good, right? Like I, I wouldn't say that it was like the most didn't change my life. And I kept doing yoga and everything. And then when I went to Santa Fe, I sang in Santa Fe for a couple of summers there, I discovered a yoga teacher there. Um, his name is T.S. Little and he teaches a, some vinyasa, some Iyengar and some Ashtanga. He's mostly Ashtanga based. And um, I had a friend who was in Santa Fe with me who introduced me to him and I thought he was incredible. So I ended up getting my certification there. I traveled to Santa Fe and got my second certification there. And so I will say, well, I'll just to sort of wrap all it up, it's a long story, is that yoga is something that has traveled with me my entire pretty much adult life. And what I love about yoga is that it changes for where I am at the time. So there are times that I will do the hour long vinyasa practice. I have to be honest, it hasn't happened recently, anytime recently, because that is not what my body wants. But I have learned to listen to my body and what it needs better with yoga than I have ever, anything else in my entire life. So to be honest, right now I'm doing a lot of Pilates. It's like with a it's with an instructor that does some yoga and some Pilates and that feels good to my body right now. But I don't lose my yoga is interspersed and intertwined with the way I teach and the way I walk and the way I teach my children and the way that I parent and everything, every single thing is has yoga as part of it. So I will say that the greatest gift, if any, if, if you do yoga, the greatest gift you can do is realize that it's a malleable, ever changing practice and that you just ask yourself, what do you need today? And it might be five minutes on the mat breathing or it might be an hour of vinyasa. But just know that it'll always be there for you. It's like an extra little friend on your shoulder at all times that can give you what you need. So, yeah, I've never had to, to say that before. It's really interesting. Thanks for asking. I've never oh, heard that story before. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me, I, I was at a summer program once and I, one of the teachers had me do some yoga exercises while singing an entire aria. Mm -hmm. And I was in, because back then I was thinking of so much in my head about like, here comes this part and I got to think about the support there and blah, blah, blah. So that was kind of the yoga journey for me was to get out of my brain a little bit, yes. you know? I think that's, really that's exactly it. I think it's really one thing when I used to teach yoga in New York City, I used to say is it's non-competitive yoga. We're, we're practicing non-competitive yoga because how many times that's what's so great about practicing at home. I think a lot of people have a love-hate relationship with practicing at home. But, you know, I know for me as somebody who was striving to be perfect when I was next to somebody on my mat, I was like, okay, their leg can go farther than mine. Yeah. So my leg has to go just as far, you know? And like, I have enough injuries now to know that that's not the right thing to say. Um, and so I think it's, again, it's getting out of your mind and realizing that there's always more and you, there's, it's not about striving for perfection. It's understanding where you are in the moment. So yeah, that's great. And it's really nice to hear other teachers that are using it like that. It's wonderful. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of when Elizabeth McDonald put me into pigeon pose for Pianjano. That was Ooh. super fun and easy in skinny black jeans. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's something we use quite often. It's very cool. A really fun question that I was wondering um, was what from the pandemic have you two learned that you were going to take forward in 
a future world where there is no pandemic. Well, there will always be a pandemic. Let me just break it to you now as somebody who now has the information. We just have to kind of move forward with that. It's funny that you say that because Elizabeth and I, this was one of the questions you did give us. And we were like, oh God, what is it? I was like, oh, to crawl into bed every day and just go to sleep. That's what I'm going to yeah. take right now. <laughs> it's hard. It's still hard to think about. Elizabeth, do you want to go first? Uh or do you want me to go? I, like, I don't care. No, 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 it's fine. I was just, I was complaining because I'm like, I don't know what I, I don't know if I, what I, I learned a lot, but I think, I think the biggest thing is that, um, the partnership that Emily and I have forged through the pandemic, we've, we've been very good friends for a long time and we've done a lot of projects together, but the partnership that we forged and the things that we've learned trying to figure out how to run a business um we're still trying to learn <laughs> and we're still oh my gosh if oh my i have God. to look at i mean i love the financial part of it but sometimes quickbooks just drives me crazy so yep. i need a va so anybody who knows a va let yeah me know. if you know a canadian va who can help us please yeah <laughs> i am ready to uh, offload that to somebody but 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 taking forward or to, out of this pandemic taking forward this connection to my business partner and as my support for the work that we're doing um, is something that, I mean, I'm grateful for it, but it's something that I will take forward. And I've learned how to trust like in a collaboration at like a, a business partner. Um, and, and that's been, that's been pretty amazing because it's also taught me, I really think it's taught me how to like, well, I don't know if this is good, but I think it's taught me how to be a workaholic, Oops. which is interesting because I think I've always worked hard. I know I've always worked hard, but I found a different level of discipline through the pandemic because I was so motivated with our, with the development of EM2 and, and then also just teaching a line. Like you're just, you're just there. You have to be disciplined to do it. Um, so yeah, so this trust in a collaboration and in a partner, and then also just the discipline, the level of discipline that's required to do some of this other stuff that I hadn't done at this level before. Well, I was that's going to answer. say, since you guys had a had another call earlier today, I was like, you must really like each other. You spend a lot of time together, don't you? Well, not physically <laughs> together, but- if we don't talk to, if we don't talk to each other for like 24 hours, we're like, what the? <laughs> You know, but then we try, we really actually, yeah, we, we, we really want to, we really try to take time away too. Like there are times we tried, we took three weeks away from each other in the summer um, because it's important, right? Because, <laughs> because it's important because it's, we have to have room back and forth, but I didn't know Elizabeth was going to say that. And I will just agree that the trust, I can't imagine ever having trust in somebody else the way that I have trust in her. Um, you know, having trust with your partner is very different. And it's funny, I read this article, I almost said it to you, Elizabeth, I saw this article, I didn't read it, but about how your friendship being like more like, like the actual relationship in your life, rather than your partner being your relationship in your <laughs> life. And I was like, hmm. it's like having yes. a work husband. It oh, is. She's my work yeah. wife. She's yeah, we're yeah. All, wives. Yeah, sure. we're work wives all the time. So that was really good. But I'll just say, and this goes back to Hannah, what you asked about yoga is that for me mm -hmm. in the pandemic, learning how to work at my own pace and my pace doesn't have to be anybody else's pace. And I do not have to judge because somebody is having more success for me faster than I had it doesn't mean that that is that I need to be at their pace. So it's constantly sort of reassessing where my pace is. I don't have to match anybody else. And I have to be true to myself in the process. So one thing I think Elizabeth and I did do is we were so passionate about stuff. We kind of rushed forward without sort of figuring out a hundred percent what our customer wanted, which is okay. Right. Cause now we're doing that. Right. But I think we went really fast and it's understanding that your process is your process and, and it's nobody else's process mm -hmm. and that's okay. Um, so to finish off, we, we asked, this to everybody and you probably might know the answer already but um i would love to hear from each of you what is your why why do you do what you do why do you wake up every morning and work with em connect and all those fun things and sing and teach what is your why my family 
my family. Yeah. I knew that's what she was going to say. <laughs> so I can't say it. She took my answer. Um, <laughs> you can say it. You have the same answer. You have the no. same answer. I mean, we have I the think same answer very, for a lot of things. <laughs> I know. I think it's a very similar answer, but I think for me, it's it's the idea that I don't want young artist experience or my child's experience to be the what my experience was to be honest right i want them to feel good about themselves i want them to feel confident i want them to know that the choices they make are not good or bad but they're their own choices i want them to be confident in their skin i want them to understand that whatever choice they make will change the world you know, and those that's for my daughters and it's also for the artists that I teach. So that's why I keep doing it. Yeah. Well, well, beautiful answers. <laughs> I love hearing all the different answers. The more we do these and before when Cass and Sammy were hosting together, hearing everyone's why is like, wow, everyone's totally different. Yeah, it's so, cool. so crazy. Yeah, that is why we do this. Sorry, I had to use the why, <laughs> but that is exactly why we do this. Because yeah. your why is not my why and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we know that we have to get you off to Betty Bye. So Betty would bye. you guys be okay if we finish off with rapid fire? Yeah. Let's okay. do it. Fantastic. Um, so you'll each answer um every question, if that's all okay. right. Okay. All right. Hannah, I'll, go like first? First. I'll go first each time. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> I'll go first. All right, I'll go I'll go Can first this time because I think you started NPR. last. All right. <laughs> I came up with this one all by myself and I hope you enjoy it. Okay. Um something I feel very passionately about. Um, do you eat bagels? And if you do, what is your favorite topic? Montreal bagels, everything all over them with cream cheese toasted. Okay, okay. No veggies, nothing? No. <laughs> okay, do we each have to do this? Yeah. So yeah. yes, but New York bagels, everything okay, yep. with veggie cream cheese, <gasps> toasted dark. And I've now started putting cucumber on it with a little bit of salt, and it's divine. Okay, you can stay. You're my favorite now. <laughs> okay, I add cucumber sometimes, but mostly just cream cheese. You just want to be like me. I know. It's true. Okay. <laughs> it is delicious. It's fair. I also love that you guys said, like, the American and Canadian versions. Like, there was you the really Montreal did. bagel and the New York bagel. Oh, there. we fight about this all the time. Yeah. Naturally. So it's about these bagels, and also she's the good cop, and I'm the bad cop, because I'm American. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Noted. It's <laughs> time we come across each other. All right. Um, what is something you have learned from the other person? Skincare. Skincare. Good one. Yep. Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, I really wasn't um, a Sephora person before I met Elizabeth. And now, like, yeah, that's all I do. Are you using the original? The original mm -hmm. Sephora? No, no, no the, the, brand, the brand. The original. What do you use? Oh, oh no. the original. Oh, I haven't tried the original yet. Fantastic. No. Okay. No, I use so many different kinds. Elizabeth and I are constantly trying them and like unboxing in front of each other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. And my thing from Emily is a sleep mask. I now can't sleep without a sleep mask. Interesting. We That's toured together. Down. See, we toured together as Women on the Verge, and because Canada Council was paying, we all stayed in one room. So we ended up like basically sleeping in the same room for weeks on end. So we learned a lot. I want to tell you what Elizabeth's problems, like the things I had to go through, the snooze button. Seriously. Oh, <laughs> that's me. That's me too. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you and okay. my husband. You and my husband both complain about oh that. My God. Like 20 times in a row. <laughs> We could have gotten half an hour more sleep. Oh. <laughs> but no, okay. you you can fall asleep fast. You gotta, I know. I know. Yeah. And there's well, joy in, in like, two minutes. knowing you have nine minutes. Okay. Yeah. Who are on. you? I can't know. I'm not your friend anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's okay, actually fine. better for your sleep cycle to just have one alarm and then not wake up because then you get more REM sleep as opposed to. Thank you, Simmy. You are my best friend now. I didn't know this is all about competition. Sleep comp it's sleep competition yeah. now. Yep. Yep. <laughs> all right, fine. Okay, well I think um I just pulled this one, but I think I know the answer already. Um, are you a morning or a night person? <laughs> I have learned to be a morning person, but I really am a night owl. 
Yeah. Like I can stay up and work and do all of that. But you know, when your kids were little, you did not, you could not do that. So yeah. I have always been a morning person. Always. I love it. It's amazing. That's why this now feels like it's three o'clock in the morning. And what is it? Oh, 845. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I knew, yes, Emily, I knew we had a connection. I knew there was yeah. something there. Um, favorite swear word in any language? Fuck. <laughs> I love how immediate it was. And how close to the mic, too. <laughs> Did it make me a little uncomfortable? Yeah. <laughs> I can't top that. I mean, it's fuck, right? Like that. Yeah, there's true. no other question here. <laughs> or tap wet. Yeah. What? What is that? Yes. <laughs> it's the yeah. slang of French tabernacle. It's bad. It's uh, probably worse ooh. than fuck. I didn't know that. That's a good one. See, I learned something every day from Elizabeth. <laughs> so that's what you've learned from her. <laughs> it's the most yeah, recent one. That was today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> that's a really good question <laughs> i love that one okay um another fun one uh what is your party trick oh, God. And, and, and specifically in in a, a non-singing group <laughs> other than singing well okay well i haven't really been to a party in a really long time so are you talking about what, what my party trick used to be yeah yeah kids it's a pandemic and i'm old come on no 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 no. really what it is is she's an introvert that's what it is i'm an extrovert yep she's the introvert so she, her party tricks are very different <clears throat> well i did have a party streak when i was very young <clears throat> i used to be able to tie a cherry stem with my tongue into a knot we all have done that no I can burp on command um roll my tongue i don't know i don't really have what kind of party tricks do i have I really you are I the have. one that always says we're not having a party in our room yeah, i'm the one that's like it's time oh. for bed. Yeah, that's, that's right and i'm always trick. like yeah there's a long story behind this we shared another room not while we were touring and elizabeth wanted to have friends over like every night until like midnight and i was like um no yeah no. <laughs> i'm with you i'm with you there Thank you, Simi. We'll share yeah. together. <laughs> Perfect. No, it really <laughs> are. See, I'm like Elizabeth. Like I'm, I'm like I was. I will stay up all night. I am a morning person, but I just, I just don't sleep. That's mostly what it is. Oof. Oh yeah. <laughs> See, I have to sleep. It's pretty gritty if I. Yeah. It's... Elizabeth, oh. what's your party trick? Yeah. I want to know. My party trick is that I can drink anybody under the table. Oh. And I usually can drink whiskey or bourbon. Drink. Oh, yes. I you do like oh, bourbon. Yeah. It's, I'm not sure if I should brag about that, but yeah, there's, there's some, there's some pretty epic stories. I'm not repeating them now, but well, that's another time. Let's just yeah. say that I'm not tiny. I can hold it. <laughs> I think that's something to be proud of personally. There you go. That's the way she said that. Okay, cool. What is a guilty pleasure or a bad habit you'll never break? <laughs> Again, I'm old. See my and... last comment? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. Um, let's see. I put guilty pleasure or a bad habit. I'll never break. I really, really love a really good drink at the end of the day. And it's really hard right now because uh, uh, drinking alcohol right now does not let me sleep very well. So it's like a, it's, that's, it's annoying. But I do. Yeah, I think good like bourbon sour or something oh mm, okay yeah that's something i think both elizabeth and i but i am not drinking alcohol right now for that very reason i can't sleep um i will say coffee mm -hmm. i yeah, oh, yeah. So, i mean when you said you didn't drink coffee it was almost a game changer i almost had to press leave meeting i agree but yep. yeah it's i stayed on just because your hair was so pretty so <laughs> but oh, you flirt <laughs> But yeah, I would say a good cup of coffee is like a yep. really good cup of coffee. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I'll learn how to make one just for you then. Okay, good. I'll teach you. I'll teach you. Coffee, bread, alcohol. I think it's just all the yes. food. 
It's carbs. all the food. Yeah, the carbs. Yeah. It's all the yeah. food. Wasn't that like Jesus's diet? So it works out well. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Water. There wasn't there water somewhere. In there? Oh. I don't know. Yeah, that turned, changed into wine. wine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you love how you're asking me of all people? I am so not the religious person at all. Oh, so the fact that I even know who Jesus is, we're good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Rain in there, Martin. Rain in. I was raised in a Jewish household, so I don't. I don't know what any of that means. Make a good team. Make a good team. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you weren't a singer, what would you be doing right now? I'd be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Pediatrician. Wow. What is something that made you happy today? This podcast. Yeah, this podcast has been really nice. Yeah, this, this really has been good. awesome. Yeah, the yeah. fact that I'm still awake means I like doing it. <laughs> Yeah. We'll try no, to get you bed as soon as possible. Yeah. There's one no, more and it's from me. No, it's not. <laughs> well, I have it's one lovely. too. I have okay, okay. some really, really count. lovely questions. Um, this is a great one. Uh, what advice would you give your younger self? Hmm. Oh God. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't worry. Don't worry about what everybody else thinks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, constantly trying to make sure everybody was thinking good things about me all the time. I always worried what everybody was thinking about me. And the other thing all is ask for help. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Good ones. <clears throat> all right, last one is who do you fan person over? Opera singer specific. Oh, opera singer specific. Oh, yeah. Well, you can say anybody if you want. Like a movie girlfriend or boyfriend or something. Oh, who do I fan girl over? I don't listen to a lot of opera these days. I know. Oh, I no. actually. You can I, see someone else. It's okay. Uh, my my fan person right now is Nick Nurse, who's the coach of the Toronto Raptors. I just finished reading his book. He's amazing. I kind of I kind of love him. So, <laughs> and he plays music, and he's like got the super great. I, he's just cool. So that's my fan girl. I don't know. I don't know. I'm having. I'm reading a lot of really good books right now. Um, so there are a lot of authors actually. I'm not really fangirling over anybody opera wise. Roger either. Martin. Oh, total oh. fan. I'm fangirling over Roger. Yeah. I'm assuming I was that's say, not she... your husband. No. <laughs> yeah. No. No. I don't <laughs> fangirl over my husband. What, what do you think I am? Um. Yeah. So... Name. I don't know. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I wasn't even thinking about that. I didn't think about that either. No, I was gonna say Tanisha Coates um, just wrote The Water Dancer, which I just read and I loved. But yeah, so Roger Martin is used to be the head of the Rotman Management School. Am I right about that? Is that how you'd say it, Elizabeth? Yeah, yeah at U of school, T. School of Management, Rotman School of Management um, at U of T, and he's a strategic thinker. And I, we listened to a podcast of his and I am like, I want Elizabeth to write him and say, I teach at U of T and we need to have coffee with you now. So, right yeah. now yeah roger martin <laughs> cool. yes so i think that's who i'm fangirling one of my people love it thank you both so so much for being here with yeah. us i can speak on behalf of hannah and myself when i say that we had an absolute blast a hoot <laughs> a hoot yes a hoot. Hoot. <laughs> that was very canadian of me i'm so sorry i love it <laughs> Thank you guys. We've had an amazing time. Yeah. I'm speaking for Elizabeth because she's my work wife, so I can. <laughs> and we have had an incredible, incredible time as well. This has been so, so much fun. So thank you so much for having yeah. us. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. It was so, so fun. My students, a couple of weeks ago on the Saturday, I drank a little too much uh, coffee and one of them came in. It was like a one o'clock lesson. I'd been at it since like 10. She's like, I hear you're in quite the mood today. <laughs> I was like, okay. Word like, travels fast. <laughs> wandering around the room like a mad woman. So. 